we're going to hopefully pray that Carol and Carol get here safely. Okay. Uh, I want, you to, want us to go to Luke chapter 12. All right. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Can we put the outline up from this morning? Um, and if you did not get a, an outline, I know we have extra. There they are. Who didn't get an outline? Did you get one, Julie? The value of one? All right. Who, anybody doesn't have one? Bert didn't get one. Okay. All right. You got one? Okay. All right, dear. There you go. That's it. What did we learn this morning? I hope you learned something. One soul is worth, One soul is worth more than the whole world. Now that can be confusing, right? A little confusing. You say, okay, one, is one soul worth more than everybody else? No, no, we're not talking about the rest of humanity. We're talking about the rest of the physical world. Okay, that makes sense? All right, that makes sense. Okay, in other words, this is what I want to get across right at this point. The soul of K is not worth any more than the soul of Bert, Brother Bert. Okay, but the soul of K is worth more than all of this physical world combined, including, they, I, I was getting texts this week from someone, I'm not going to tell you who, <laughs> all right, and they were talking about the animal creation. What's the purpose of the panda bear? <laughs> and, yeah, let me get this. <laughs> um. Okay, hang on a minute. You're, you're going to laugh at this. It's kind of funny. I, I did respond, and uh, uh, where is it? I can't find it. Anyway, uh, they were asking, well, what's the purpose of, of, of the panda bear? And I thought, well, the panda bear is one of those creatures that gives us delight, right? And joy. Uh, <clears throat> now, all of this creation... You go to, how many have been to an aquarium? You been to an aquarium? Anybody been, you never been to an aquarium, James? No, I've never. You know, there's a wonderful aquarium up the road here in Phoenix. Good evening. <laughs> so good to have you. Thank you, sweetheart. Honey, where, there's supposed to be another row of chairs back there. Where did they go? There's supposed to be three rows of chairs. Where? Where did they go? Uh -uh. There's two chairs here. Oh, there's two over there? Okay, all right, okay. He reconfigured it, yeah. Yeah, he, he did his own thing. Yeah, okay. Go to an aquarium and go look at the lionfish. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. See if you can look up for it. Just go there and look up a lionfish. I want you to see this fish that God created. And it is somewhat poisonous. But you look at this thing and you say, how did this get created? <clears throat> in, the, in the creative, and we go back to Genesis, of course, right, Bob? And the, the creative genius and divinity of God. <clears throat> Can you find a lionfish? There. See, look at it. That's a lionfish. That's a fish. Okay? And if you try to attack it, okay, it it's like a porcupine, and it has uh, some poison on it if you try to attack. So it has uh, its own defense. So uh, like sharks and other fish, they don't eat the lionfish. Okay? So... But, I mean, look at the mark. I marvel at God's creation. Okay, yeah. I mean, 
And there's so many creatures, just like, okay, almost all of you have never seen a lionfish. When I go to one aquarium, that's the first thing I want to see. I want to see the lionfish. <laughs> okay? Because that's that to me is so incredible. You look at the intricate detail, the colors that flash and flourish before you, the brilliance. And now, I'm going to tell you something. God has a purpose for this creature. If nothing else, that we can go to the aquarium and look at this creature <laughs> and give us delight. Amen? <clears throat> yeah. So, I love the lionfish. I just do. <clears throat> and, uh, I mean, but... Now, I've gone scuba diving in uh, the Cayman Islands. <clears throat> We went there for our 20th anniversary. Oh, by the way, June 9th, big anniversary Sunday. Anybody else have an anniversary in June? Okay, so we are going to honor Matt and Edie for their 60th, 60th wedding anniversary. That's like, wow. <clears throat> When did you get married? When you were five? You know? <laughs> All right. 60 years. It will be Carol and my, Carol's and my 49th. We're almost golden. Mm -hmm. Almost golden. Mm -hmm. I, James is sitting there. I can't believe it. I can't believe this fountain of youth that I'm looking at, right? 49 years we've been married. We got married when we were three years old. Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, glory. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I was already a sophomore at Maranatha, and she came. And she won't tell you this, but she was the girl to try to, to, try to date. Hmm. I mean, everybody, she she came from Michigan. She came from one of the leading youth groups, First Baptist Farmington. And uh, it was funny because all of the Michigander kids wanted her to date a Michigander. And here I was a California nut, and they didn't want her to, mar to, to date, marry me. They didn't want me, her to date me, okay? And then when I called her dad... Eventually, he didn't want me to date her. <laughs> it only took him mm, 40 years to warm up to me. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I mean, the sad thing about it is he was a pastor, and he, he, he left the ministry. So um, he was very supportive, but the last 10 years of his life, he was very kind to me. Talking about your dad. You heard. I told him you were the hot stuff over at Maranatha when you, when you came. <laughs> she was. She's still beautiful. I mean, you know. So, anyway. we. It's been great. It's been a great ride. I, I, I'm telling you. But these children, they bring you... Real burdens, don't they? All right. See, children have children problems. Adults have adult problems. You know? Okay, and I'm looking around here. Brother Bert, he's, his heart has been broken. Okay? Brother Bob? You know? Kay? she just like to hear from her son, right? And we got Chance, right, up in Montana. We need to pray for him. I mean, he's got big adult problems, you know? Carol, you shared a little bit of your heart with me about your kids. The girls are doing great. The boys are naughty, you know? <clears throat> it's just kind of the way it is. Yeah. Well, I told that to the soul winners yesterday. I said, 
you have no idea the attacks that are going to come after you and come at, when you're knocking on doors. When you're doing this, and that man showed up today where Josie's sitting, Salvador, the devil didn't like that. We won a guy to Christ yesterday, and he came this morning. Yes, he just came on his own. It was so exciting. So, but I want to tell you something for all of you. My children, you could not ask for better children as far as that goes. It's the in-laws that, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, my son Paul, you were you here when he spoke? I mean, how sincere and genuine and precious he is. All of my children are that way. They just and they adore their mother. They tolerate me, but they adore their mother. <laughs> okay, I don't know. We'll see. They always send me a Father's Day card, so I, with a I don't know what a burger or something. Okay, all right. <laughs> Praise the Lord for what a burger. All right. Okay. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for it? This is why we go soul winning. Because the soul, the soul is, 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 is inestimable in value. Every, and, and let me say this, write this thought down. Here's a thought for you. You got a pen? Who needs a pen? Write this thought down. Who needs a pen? Everybody got one? Here's your, it's on your notes. You do not, this is very important, you do not have a soul. You are a soul. Okay? A person does not have a soul. A person is a soul. I do not have a soul. I am a soul. Okay. Now, what you see, okay, here's, here's something to think about. I'm giving you something a, a little deeper than you're going to get in some country bumpkin church, okay? All right. God bless the country bumpkins. Amen. I love them. But when you see me and you meet me and you talk to me, you don't see me. The real me, this is just the house I live in. Okay? This body is the house I live in. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the real me is my soul inside. My mind, my emotions, and will. And when I die, I'm going to tell you something. I've got to give you a little clue here. When I die, and if, if, if I die, I, I want to go up with the upper taker, amen? <laughs> not the undertaker. All right. <laughs> I'm looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. But that's why, that's why I'm trying to take care of my body, Kelson. I'd rather not. Be translated. I'd, ra I'd rather have. I'd rather hear that shout and the trump, Amen, and be faithful till He come for us. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. All right. Right. Exactly. I don't know what's going to rupture, but <clears throat> okay. So the soul is so important. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He can't. And, and over in Psalms, it talks about no man can by any means redeem the soul of his brother. We can't, okay? The only thing that can purchase a soul is what? The blood of Christ, all right? Okay, let's go over to Luke. Luke. Luke chapter 12. And I'm going to give you a thought that you're going to live on the rest of the week, amen? <laughs> I shared a little bit of it with Carol. And she liked it. It got her approval, so we're going with it. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. 
Hmm, pretty good stuff in here. 12.3, therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be hurt. By the way, well, let me say this, I don't mean to bounce around. We all, listen, I'm gonna, this is really serious. Are you ready? All of us need to pray for Amanda. <laughs> okay, there's complications. Get that done? Amanda Lamb, Noah and Amanda, okay? Uh, she's been in the hospital now for two days and they're trying to induce labor. They might have to do a C-section, we don't know. So she's just, she's like her dad, you know, kind of a bulldog. She ain't gonna come unless she, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so there was complications with the baby. There was issues with the uh, heartbeat on the baby, and but they got it. They got it back to normal now. So it's touch and go here. Yeah. So I need you to pray, and and of course, when I I hear a word, I will text you all and let you know. Okay. Yeah, I'll let you know. All right. <clears throat> I just that came to my mind, and I just want to let you know. Uh, <clears throat> Whatsoever ye have spoken in the darkness shall be heard in the light, verse 3, chapter 12, 3. And that which ye have spoken in, in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Boy, that's all those dirty jokes and all of that. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. There it is. The body is, okay, the, let me tell you something. Here, 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 this is important. The body is important. It's important how we treat it, okay? But what's all important is our soul, <clears throat> okay? That's, that's what's going to live forever. This body is not going to live forever. This body is going to go on the right. This, this, okay, 1 Corinthians 15, right? This corruptible body must put on incorruption. The Lord is going to change this bio body, literally transform this bio, vile body in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's what our Bible says, right? Bart's going to get a new body. He's been looking forward to it, right? Every day. All right. I'm looking forward to it. That's right. Uh, you know, my... My spiritual daddy, he was a country preacher, but he was brilliant. Mm -mm. Don't get any, don't get, don't get it wrong. Oh, oh, Papa Don, he talked like this, and he said, he said, uh, he said, he, he had the most beautiful voice, but he had a voice like yours, Bob, just soft, but boy, oh, he could preach, man. He was the greatest preacher I've ever known, Doctor Don Camp, and he said this: "You think you're big stuff." <laughs> He said, you're nothing. I'm nothing. All we are is souped up dust. <laughs> he said, you're just souped up dust. That's all you are. He said, some of you got a whole lot of dust. <laughs> and this dust is going to be transformed. Amen? How exciting. All right. Now look. I don't pretend to fully understand all of this, but I will tell you this. When we die and this corruptible body goes into the ground, I told you today, when a person dies, they lose about an ounce, maybe a couple ounces. How much does a soul weigh? Okay. That soul is gone. Now, somehow, okay, in the mind of God, in the plan of God, when our, when, when, when our soul departs, right, God has an intermediate body for that person in heaven. Let me put it in, let me put it in practical terms. God has a loner for you, <laughs> okay? You're not going to be flying around there in, in a spirit body, in, in, as a spirit. He has a body for you up there, okay? 
at the rapture, he's going to have a loaner for you, okay? You know, when you take your car in to shop and you get a loaner, well, you're going to get a loaner, okay? And then when, here, we're, we're delving a little deeper, right? Nobody's going to sleep right now, are you? <clears throat> okay? <laughs> you want to hear about this. Because I've done a lot of meditating on it, <laughs> okay? At the rapture, okay? I'm going to tell you this. I have no idea what God's going to do with those loner bodies. I don't know. That's his department, amen? All I know is that body in the ground or that got eaten by the sharks, think about that, or got burned up, or, yeah, uh, cremated, yeah, you think God, you think it's a, a big job for God to bring those molecules back together? Not at all. We have a mighty God. And you can burn up that body. Uh, you can, whatever. And everybody wants to get cremated today because it's cheaper. But I think it's desecration of a body. That's my opinion, but I'll leave it there. Okay. You know, if you get if you get cremated, we'll still have your funeral. <laughs> but you know what? You won't care at that point. <laughs> All right? Okay. So the dead in Christ, the Bible says, will be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this body is going to be transformed in that moment, and then those bodies in the grave. And there's only dust in there. I mean, let's face it. And he's going to bring those molecules back from all of those bodies that were desecrated and burned. And he knows where them molecules are. That's how great my God is. And he's going to take those molecules and transform them into an incredible heavenly body that will last for eternity. We're not done yet. We're going to heaven with those bodies. And the amazing thing is, we're coming back to earth with those bodies. <laughs> I can't explain this, folks. But we are going to be dwelling in our glorified bodies amongst people with temporal bodies. <laughs> what a time it's going to be. Totally different than we can really conceive of right now. <laughs> And I really believe this in my heart, that the world will be able to tell the difference between the glorified body people and the earthly body people. <laughs> you and I are going to be serving the Lord. We're going to be on the city council. We'll be in doing whatever. And I believe this. I, I said this the other night, I think, on Wednesday night, right? What it's going to be like in the millennium is I think Jesus is going to call, you're coming to Mount Zion, right? So we're going to be here in Tucson, and the Lord Jesus is going to call a convocation. He's going to call a meeting, and he's going to give the command for us to, to think to go there. And we're in Jerusalem. <laughs> Just like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, he did it with Philip. Exactly. He gave us a foretaste. Okay. Philip was found in Azotus, right? He said, I need you over here. <laughs> That's our God. Mm -mm. So we're going to be talking to earthly beings here, and Jesus will call a conversation, and all of a sudden, <laughs> hey, he's gone. Where'd he go? We're going for a Revival meeting in Jerusalem. <laughs> it's going to be glorious. I like to think about these things. Don't you? Uh, all right. Take a look now. This is important. Um, here we go. So, kill the, don't worry about those who kill the body after that. Uh, have no more than the, that they can do. <clears throat> but I will forewarn you <clears throat> whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Right? Yea, I say unto you, fear 
him. Here we go now. Are you ready for it? Our, oh, I just love this passage. Here we go. Are not five, read it with me. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And one of them is not, is for, and one of them is forgotten before God. He's asking the question. Are they forgotten before God? No. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Verse seven. But even the very hairs of your head. You want to put it up there? Luke 12, 7. Come on, buddy. You're making big money here, right? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Luke 12, 7. Put that up there. All right. Here we go. Read it. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more, what's the word? Value. That's right. The value of one. That's what we're talking about this morning. The value of one precious soul is inestimable. All right? Now let's go back to fear not. Ready? Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than what? Many sparrows. And God's people said, Amen. That means every one of you. And what's the key word? <clears throat> value. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. The Lord Jesus is saying, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's saying, you are precious to me. Especially my blood-bought children. <laughs> if that isn't the greatest verse in the whole Bible next to John 3.16, I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know of it. More wonderful verse. You start getting down on you. Well, nobody loves me. I've had a hard life. <laughs> he knows every hair of our head. That's not a big job for James. <laughs> All right. Or me. <laughs> All right. See that? I don't know what it is about this side here, man. It, it grows like my fig tree out back. It explodes. <laughs> my wife's got, she, she's my little barber, man. She's got to trim this thing constantly. So this makes up for this. <laughs> okay. But now get this. The hairs of your head are all what? Numbered. Each one of these little strands of hair has a number on it to God. Mm -mm. Not just, oh, you know, Julie, she's got the hair, man. Wow. You got the head of hair. All right. I need to borrow some of it. Okay. Paste it on. So the other day when I was in the shower and that those hairs went down the drain, hair... 10,573 number, the five, it was a particular numbered hair went down there. <laughs> Seriously. That, listen to me, that is how personalized God is to you and me. He's saying to you, you are of great value. The hairs of your head are valuable to me. <laughs> Amen. I don't know what you said. <laughs> All right. Okay, long hair, yeah. Yeah, I was telling you about my granddaughter. She's got that long blonde hair, you know, and she's a swimmer. <laughs> we had a we had a race in California. I told her I can whip you. <laughs> my brother had a little pool, you know. So I got a picture. I'll, I'll bring the picture sometime. I'll, I'll show it to you. But they cheated. Felicity, Felicity threw a wet towel at me. 
so Elizabeth beat me. <laughs> so she put, she has that picture up on her wall, and we're both diving in. You know, Felicity, she had a she had someone com implicit with her. Yeah, to slow me down. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. The value of one. Number two, quickly, a vision for one. The vision for one. <coughs> Can you put that up there? The next. <coughs> Get a vision for one. All right. Proverbs twenty nine eighteen. It says, "Where there is no vision, the people perish." If you don't have a vision, you know what that means. Let's put it in real simple terms. If I don't have purpose in my life, my life is perishing. You need to have a purpose for when you get up. I'm trying to give you that purpose. One thing every Christian ought to do, like I said, I don't just leave a tract at a house and have them throw it in the garbage. What do I do? I put a little, I write while I'm waiting for them to answer the door. I take that moment. I don't say, <laughs> no, I got that track, man. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to write a note on there. I love you in the Lord, man. I love you. Jesus loves you, right? Smiley face. Put something there to, you know what? They come home from a hard day at work. James is going to come home for our day. You're going to find out, look at that. Somebody left me a card. And they, they didn't just leave me a card. They left me a note. And then I pray for them. You say, well, you don't know their name. Jesus does. Okay. Always have. And you don't have to have 50 or 100. But always have with you two or three tracks. Always. Okay, you're going to have an opportunity, and then when that opportunity is passed, you're going to say to yourself, ah, "Why didn't I have a track?" I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> a perfect example. We knocked on the first door. Julie and Randy, and what's your name? Mark. Okay. Julie, Julie, Randy, and Mark <clears throat> knocked on the door. But they didn't have to knock on the door, did you? No. Okay. They had it easy. <clears throat> they didn't realize nine out of the ten doors, nobody's going to answer. <clears throat> they didn't realize what gold. So this lady came out of her car, and Julie started talking to her. She said, hi, how are you? And she said, well, and Julie was smart in this essence. She said, what's your name? And she said, Julie. <laughs> Julie, just explode. Oh, I'm Julie. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. And so she gave her a tract. And I, I saw that things were going well. And so I like to kind of come in if I can, kind of like we did with Salvador. And... Uh, the problem, I'll tell you what the problem was, what happened, is once I came over there and I began to talk to her, they took off. Right? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, here was the problem with that. Julie, this lady in the garage, she almost had tears in her eyes. She, and she had two, uh, what do you call those, braces? On her, like kind of like you were, Bob, on her knees. And she had had some surgery. And she looked up at me with the saddest eyes. And she said, I just lost my husband recently. Well, guess what? Julie was gone 
Oh, this will blow your mind. You, are you ready for it? Are you sitting down? What was his name? Randy. <laughs> his name was Randy. Wow. But Julie and Randy and Mark Kelson was gone. Julie, come back! We just buried Julie's husband out at the Memorial Cemetery. And Julie could have spent the entire afternoon with her. But she took off. Take time to learn about people's burdens. It was, it was just mind-blowing, Bert, what some of the things that happened yesterday. You know, so we have a Julie here lost her husband, and Julie here lost her husband. We have the name of her husband is Randy, and we have a Randy here. <clears throat> I mean, it's like, doo -doo -doo -doo. man, it's only the Lord. And this precious lady you pray for, her name is Julie. She lives at 20... 4900 North Thurston, you pray for. All right. Okay, I dropped the ball. I'm going to tell you how I dropped the ball. Well, how did I drop the ball? Well, I was talking to her, and she was coming home from working on something. Anyway, she was real tired out. But I have a tract, a sympathy tract in my binder. <laughs> And I should have pulled that out and given it to her. Duh. So that was where I dropped the ball. But she, but we'll see her again. We'll see her again. God willing, we'll see her again. All right. Get a vision for one. So I'm thinking about this lady, and I'm praying for her. Julie. I'm praying for this Julie, and I'm praying for Julie. She comes all the way up from Benson to go soul winning with us. Now think about that. That's an hour drive. That she comes to come and knock on doors. What's that? No AC. no AC. That's right in her car. Where there is no vision of people perish. Focus on one. Lead some soul today. I'll give you a couple. I'll give you two illustrations here, and we'll be done. Doctor George Truett was the great pastor of the. Probably the greatest church in America at the time, First Baptist Church of Dallas, along with Akron Baptist Temple. And Dr. George Truett would go out and preach revivals, right? <clears throat> he went way over on east side of Texas and he preached revival. And he couldn't understand. Nobody was coming forward. <clears throat> And he got burdened. He said, Lord, you know, bring some folks forward. And I'll tell you what happened. The last night of the meeting, a little boy came in. His name was Wally. <laughs> and he heard Dr. Truett preach. And that little boy was the only one who came forward. <laughs> And Dr. Truett dealt with him, led him to Christ. I think he was eight years old at the time, maybe nine. And his mom and dad let him come. He got home and his wife said, Well, dear, how was the meeting? Uh, he said, <laughs> Not much happened, honey. It was, you know, the people were, you know, they were nice people, but nobody would come forward and... I don't think anybody was said. wait, he said there was one little boy. <laughs> and he told his wife about that little boy. His name was Wally. You say, well, what's the significance of that? And that little boy got saved, and he never forgot Dr. George Truett. Largest church in America at the time. Mm -mm went to Bible college, went to seminary. 
and Wally Criswell succeeded George Truitt at the First Baptist Church of Dallas. <laughs> the only one who got saved was Dr. George Truitt's successor. <laughs> How about that? Did you get that? Yes. Okay. And he was there, Dr. Dr. Uh, Wally Criswell was there. Matter of fact, I met Dr. Criswell many years ago in uh, Garland, Texas, in the greatest uh, pastor's meeting I've ever been to. It was called the uh, Revival on uh, it, it, Conference, Core Conference, C-O-R-E, Conference on Revival and Evangelism. And I met Wally uh, Criswell, and he preached. Tremendous man of God. And he preached at that meeting. Dr. Jack Hiles preached down in Atlanta, Georgia. And something incredible happened that night. You know what happened that night? There was a snowstorm in Atlanta. Hail and snow. Well, Dr. Haas got to this auditorium, and the auditorium sit, 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 probably seated 1,500 people. And there was less people in there than we have tonight. I mean, there was, there was maybe a dozen people in that 1,500-seat auditorium, right? What do you think Dr. Hiles did? Oh, well, it's me. I'm going to go suck my thumb in the corner. He preached just like there was 50,000 people, and, and he was like a house of fire. And what he didn't know, there was a, a, a part-time preacher out there who was a mail carrier named Curtis. And that part-time preacher mail carrier came forward that night and got on fire for God. And that was none other than Curtis Hudson. And Curtis Hudson went on to pastor Forest Hills Baptist Church and became the fastest growing church in America. So small crowds don't bother me. We might have had the next Billy Graham, we might have had the next Charles Finney in this service this morning, Salvador. And Louis will tell you what his name means. Savior. Salvador. I mean, you can't believe this guy. Randy's there talking. You know, he's talking to him. You know how he is. And I come up and he showed us around inside what they, the job they were doing. And I said, do you attend anywhere? You know, and he, well, I attended a Catholic church. And, this, and and I gave him a simple, pulled out the track right here. You all can do it. You don't need me. I said, let me give you the greatest truth I've ever known. For God so loved the world, right? John 3.16. And then I asked him, has anyone ever shown you the plan of salvation from the Bible? That's what you tell people. Has anyone ever shown you the plan of salvation from the Bible? And you have it right there. Beep, 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 beep. A caveman can do it, right? Caveman can do it. Anybody who can read, okay? He said, no. He said, but I would like you to do that. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Salvador is one out of 100, maybe one out of 1,000. But that's what you go for, the one out of 100. All the rejections and all of the, you know, negative. But you come across receptive people. And he was like, I mean, so attentive. And then Frank came in over and kind of, you know, cheered us on. And, he, and then I said, after I led him through the plan of salvation, I said, would you like to pray to receive Christ as your Savior? And he said something I've never heard before in my life. You know what he said? Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do this. I said, hey, man, we're going to do this. And I said, they'll help you pray. And I said, now, 
This is what I told them. I said, you have to mean it from your heart. It doesn't mean a thing. It's just because it says, with your mouth and your what? Heart. And with your heart and your mouth. It's not good enough to have it in your mouth. Okay? And if you have it in your heart, you're going to speak it in your mouth. Okay. So, um, so I told him, I said, when I was done, when I was done, I said, these are our service times. And then what is the last thing we ask him, Kelson? Say that louder. Do you have a phone? Do you have a phone? Oh, yeah. And he pulls it out. And I said, well, could you go to YouTube? So he goes to YouTube. Right? And then what do we do? We put in Cliff Lawton. Right? And there it comes up. And there's Cliff Lawton. And we subscribe them. And now I do this. They always love this when I do this. Ready? <laughs> Look at hundreds of videos. Hundreds of videos. Mm -hmm. And you can pick the one you, you, there's titles. There's titles. And you can pick the one you want. Mm -hmm. All right? And I always suggest one. Uh, I, I said, watch the wounds of Christ. I think you might like that. You know? And uh, so he said, that is so cool when you talk to young people. All these kids got phones. The poor biology professor over at Saguaro High School resigned. Biology professor resigned after 10 years. You know why? Because that poor man who loved those students could not get those students to get off their phones. That was so sad to hear. And yet, maybe if the biology professor would have had a YouTube channel, he could have said to them, let's all go to our phones. <clears throat> right? And there it is. <clears throat> all right? Amen. There it is. What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, Facebook too. Yeah. Sunday, and I turn on the YouTube on, on my TV, and there you were. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Well, it's funny because <clears throat> technology knows what we're doing. I think so. They do. Yes. Uh, it's scary because I'm talking to somebody on the phone about something. Uh, I'll give you an example. Okay, uh, I was talking to uh, my brother-in-law about a golf club on the phone. And I got, I got an ad for that golf club. I ran on my phone. <laughs> so it's it's crazy. It is it is scary. It's it's spooky. It really is. AI. Yep, AI is watching us all the time. <clears throat> Listen, folks. There's a value in every precious soul. I don't care who it is. They're all precious. Let's say it together. Ready? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All right. You know what? I think we're on time. You want to watch this a little bit? Okay. Go. We're about halfway through. Go halfway through with it. This is Jim Elliott. He went to the Aka Indians in South America. Yep. That's where we, we already... We, we saw half of it. All right, go. <laughs> <laughs>